Yes. You. Good evening. My name is Alan Benson and I am with the African American Initiative. The African American Initiative consists of various stakeholders throughout the Louisville community that explore and analyze policies that directly and indirectly affect the African American community. Today, we're going to discuss racism from slavery to present. And this event is live on YouTube, Facebook, and radio WLOU. This event could not have been made possible without the AAI team and our co-conveners, and I thank you. Now, to some, racism doesn't exist as they would say that we live in a colorblind society, while others would say that it's more prevalent today than in most recent years. In either case, and as I see it, racism is the elephant in the room, and it's something that must be discussed today. We have a group of esteemed presenters and I would like to welcome them. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Gerald Neal. Good evening, this is Gerald Neal and it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you a distinguished, knowledgeable panel of experts to delve into questions that have been raised generation after generation as we strive to understand the scourge and legacy of racism that continues to create impacts that range from disrespect, disregard, disparities of all kinds, outright overt displays that often ends in injury and death. This happens not only in our country, but around the world, but particularly as it relates to African-Americans and people, other people of color in the United States of America. These many forms of oppression have been protested throughout history from the peculiar institution of slavery to the current expression of protests. Enough is enough. A demand that fundamental change take place to dissuade police abuse, health, environmental and economic and every other disparity that is endemic to every institution in this country. This raises a number of questions that beg for answers. What is the root of this scourge? How was it perpetuated and made part of the fabric of our society today? What must be done to counter and or address today's structural and institutional racism? Where from here? But we have with us some people that can provide some of those answers. We have Dr. George C. Wright with us, as well as Dr. Joy Gleason Carew, Professor Cedric Merlin Powell, and Ms. Shamika Parrish Wright. We're gonna begin with Dr. George C. Wright, a historian and scholar who earned his bachelor and master's degrees from University of Kentucky and a PhD in history from Duke University. Dr. Wright is a distinguished teacher, lecturer, and author. In his distinguished professional career, he has served as Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost of the University of Texas, Arlington, and President of Prairie View a &M University in Texas. He currently is a Distinguished Research Professor at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Wright takes us to the roots of racism. Dr. Wright. Good evening. It is indeed a pleasure to be a part of this distinguished group of scholars. On August the 20th, 2019, this was a time 
when our nation remembered that 400 years ago, roughly, slavery was introduced into the British colony of North America in Virginia. Interestingly enough, while scholars debated all of the implications of that, and they pointed out the tragedies that occurred and the like, at some point, many people forgot that while 1619 is an appropriate date to remember, that the slave trade of which these 20 individuals who were enslaved in Virginia were part of had actually started decades earlier. The Atlantic slave trade, scholars do agree on, is the largest forced migration of human beings in the history of humankind. It lasted more than 300 years. If you want to use a conservative number, then people will say 8.5 million to 9 million people were enslaved in the Americas, both North and South America. If you want to use a higher number, some people will say 30 to 40 million people. But whichever number that you feel comfortable in using, you also have to take into effect that so many individuals who were part of this died along the way from the moment their villages were attacked or when they were sold and they died on the Middle Passage and the like. Two years ago, there was an exhibit in London, England at the London Dock Museum. It was entire, entitled England, Sugar and Slavery. And this exhibit that had well over 100 different panels connected with it talked about the connection of slavery to the economic growth of England, but also the British colonies of that time, which included what would become the United States. It pointed out that slavery generated so much wealth that it would essentially fuel the Industrial Revolution. It would, it would generate wealth in England, France, Holland, and, and Germany, Spain, Portugal, among the European countries. It would lead to slavery being introduced into the Caribbean, into South America, and into North America. Uh, again, so much of the wealth then and so much this, these exhibits said of the very wealth of these countries down to the present, including the United States, to be tied directly to slavery. This exhibit, as well as scholars who have looked at this, have often asked the question, why were the Africans enslaved? We know now, of course, that for decades they that there were many whites who were brought from Europe to the Americas, the term was indentured servitude, but clearly their existence was very much like African slaves. A major problem for them turned out to be disease that many of them died in when being introduced into the Americas. Also, many indigenous people already in the Americas were actually enslaved, but in having contact with first Europeans and then with Africans, they died out of, at a rate exceeding 90%. Ironically, maybe tragically, the Africans came from an environment where East and West traders had often come into contact and that the Africans had had more contact with European di diseases, African diseases, Asian diseases. And so consequently, two things that were causing problems in what was called the New World, malaria and yellow fever, the Africans had a certain level of resistance to that. So ironically, disease played a role. But if that was not enough, many Europeans and many Americans would find scriptures in the Bible where they said, starting in Genesis, that God ordained these people. So clearly, one of the most important aspects to understand about slavery was its economic roots, but also the rational 
civilization that started from the beginning, that whites would say that blacks were made for slavery, that they were ideal for slavery, they were ordained for slavery by God. So by the time of the height of the colonial period, 1740 going to the American Revolution, slavery existed in all of the British colonies of North America, and especially the New England colonies had become very rich on it. During the American Revolutionary War, we see something played out that would continue in America, and that is the men who we designate as being first in freedom in America were also first in slavery. That George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, men from the North as well, tied their successful revolution to entrenching slavery. Ironically, for many African Americans and Black people fought on both sides of the war, fighting with England led to freedom for them after the war. So ironically, the British, not the Americans, really took the first step toward freeing Black people. So it's fair to say that our founding fathers were first in freedom and first in slavery. If you jump to the emancipation, to the end of slavery in the 1860s, the question that has to be asked, and I think is very relevant for, relevant for us today, did freedom lead to equality? It did not. Many scholars said that freedom in 1865 or, or emancipation becomes, quote, a new form of slavery, that laws would be interacted, that there would be violence that would start, and these that racial discrimination would exist for at least the next 100 years, if not longer. So, and much of that was driven by economics. So if you go back to the beginning of Black enslavement, you then go through Blacks in the revolution, you go through Blacks in the emancipation of slavery, economics plays a role and racial discrimination played a role. So the question can be asked, when has racial equality existed or wh what will lead to racial equality? So slavery and racial discrimination or freedom and racial discrimination have often been coterminous for Blacks. Thank you, Mr. Neal, for your time. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Wright. Now we will have Professor Cedric Merlin Powell, a distinguished attorney and professor of law at the Louis D. Brandeis School of Law, also an attorney with Wyatt, Tarrant, and Combs here in Louisville. Professor Powell received his Juris Doctor degree from the New York University School of Law. He is, noted, uh, he is a noted author and scholar of of many law review articles, received many honors and recognitions for his scholastic and teaching excellence. Professor Powell is currently working on a book entitled Post-Racial Constitutionalism and the Roberts Court. He brings perspectives on race and the law. Professor Powell. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and I should make a correction. I don't want to be charged with the unauthorized practice of law. I'm the Wyatt Tarrant and Combs uh, Professor of Law. I'm in a, in a chair at the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. Today, I want to develop some themes that I am addressing in my book, Post-Racialism and the Roberts Court. And in fact, this was a perfect time. I'm honored to be here with the distinguished panelists. And when Senator Neal called me, I definitely want to jump at this opportunity. It always puts together an excellent discussion. But this is sort of the first chapter of my book and it starts in 1883 with the civil rights cases. Mm -hmm. Nearly everyone always talks about Plessy versus Ferguson and Justice uh, Harlan's famous colorblind dissent. Our constitution is colorblind. It knows no racial caste. But 13 years before that, perhaps one of the most important decisions in our race history was the civil rights cases decided in 1883. This was a devastating case. It spelt the end of the first reconstruction. 
It held that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional because Congress did not have the power to enact that type of legislation. And this type of notion or conception of congressional power and what discrimination is continues to this day, 2020. And I'm gonna show that briefly. But I wanna develop two concepts, post-racial constitutionalism and a related concept of colorblind constitutionalism. One of the major things that the civil rights cases did was to hold that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. And it did so in a peculiar way that still resonates to this day. First, it rejects structuralism. It doesn't look at systemic inequality or structural inequality, but it looks at individuals in society. And individuals can pick and choose where they want to go, if they want to go to a movie theater or if they want to ride on a bus or if they want to eat at a restaurant. These are only private indignities uh, that can be termed discrimination. So the civil rights cases does two things. It says the 13th amendment is meaningful, but after formal slavery is abolished, that's it. We don't talk about badges and incidents of slavery. We don't talk about the present day effects of past discrimination. All of the slavery has been ended so we can move forward. And also it says private discrimination is unreachable by the government. So a white person can pick and choose whether or not you can go to the opera tonight or whether or not you can go to the restaurant. These are minor indignities that the newly emancipated slaves just have to deal with. They're already citizens and really the United States has given them too much. There are two devastating quotations that I wanna read from the civil rights cases. And notice this, this is in 1883, just 18 years after slavery. It would be running the slavery argument into the ground to make it apply to every act of discrimination which a person may see fit to make as to the guests he will entertain or as to the people he will take into his coach or cab or car or admit to his concert theater or deal with in other matters of intercourse of business. And then finally the court says, when a man emerges from slavery and by the aid of beneficent legislation has shaken off the inseparable concomitants of that state, there must be some stage in the progress of his elevation, which he takes the rank of a mere citizen and ceases to be the special favorite of the laws. And when his rights as a citizen or a man are to be protected in the ordinary modes by which other men's rights are protected. So it's just saying that 18 years after slavery, you have all of your rights move on. This is an early example of post-racial constitutionalism. And I don't mean that in the aspirational sense. I mean that the US Supreme Court has always tried to move beyond and transcend race in order to preserve systemic inequality and structural racism. If you take any decision by the Supreme Court in terms of its race jurisprudence, there are three identifying features. And I call these a series of myths. There's a historical myth, where history is not acknowledged. There's a definitional myth where discrimination is defined so narrowly that it is defined out of existence or made very trivial. And then there's the rationalization. So you see this in the civil rights cases. First of all, since slavery has been eradicated, there is no discrimination. The state is not actively discriminating against citizens and private white citizens can determine whether they want to entertain or not. And then the court rationalizes that by saying, we've given African-Americans all the rights that they're entitled to. In fact, to give them more would be uh, doing a special AIDS package. And you see that dialogue continuing all the way into the modern day with affirmative action. Let me just talk about two courts and then I'll get out of the way. Burger Court is from 1969 to 1986. The Rehnquist Court is from 1986 to 2005 and the Roberts Court, which is the major focus of my book, is from 2005 until the present day. But each of these courts interlock. The Burger Court uh, isn't really paid that much attention to because it's in relation to the Warren Court, which is viewed as very liberal. But the Burger Court was devastating in a number of areas, particularly school desegregation. There's probably one of the worst school desegregation cases ever, Milliken versus Bradley, 
which stops school desegregation efforts at the district line. That leads to uh, the exclusive segregated schools in the urban centers with uh, suburbs being uh, exonerated or insulated from any desegregation efforts. So Burger Court is responsible for that. The Rehnquist Court is responsible for colorblind constitutionalism, but that's really just a form of post-racialism as well. The Rehnquist Court would always try to balance race as one in many factors, but in doing so would acknowledge race while at the same time ignoring it. There's a series of cases where the court said that any race conscious remedial efforts will be held to the highest level of scrutiny, which is strict scrutiny. And whenever you apply strict scrutiny, all lawyers know that it's constitutionally fatal. Then we have the Roberts Court, our present day court. And in a case that happened here in Louisville, parents involved versus uh, city schools, it happened in Seattle and Louisville, uh, Chief Justice Roberts says this, and this is what post-racial constitutionalism is. The way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So apart from any type of positive remedial efforts to eradicate structural inequality, the court will look very skeptically and try to hold things unconstitutional if race is even involved. In fact, I argue that the Roberts Court is actively engaged in dismantling all anti-discrimination law. You heard about the famous case Shelby County versus Holder. That's a prime example of that. And it brings together all of the concepts that I've been talking about. The court ignores the history of the Voting Rights Act. It says that there isn't any discrimination because Congress relied upon old discrimination like literacy tax, poll taxes uh, and lynching. That has all been uh, done away with. So you need to find new discrimination and there's new discri no new discrimination because you have an African-American president, African-American mayors, African-American legislators. So again, the court actually rationalizes the oppression that it leaves in place. Finally, if you can unify all of these decisions in courts in terms of post-racial constitutionalism, four or five factors come up. One is that discrimination only very rarely occurs. And if it does, it's not because of a structure or system, it's because there's an evil individual. And you have to find that evil individual by proving discriminatory intent. There has to be some type of state action. The Constitution protects individuals, not race or groups. There's no right to win under the Constitution because of your race. The court embraces formalistic equality, meaning that no one is enslaved anymore. The marketplace is open. And if you can do what you want to do, you should do it and not be hampered by race. And then post-racial constitutionalism, which is a move to move beyond race, is used over and over again by the court to protect white privilege and the status quo of inequality. So subordination is the touchstone of the Roberts Court. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Professor Powell. Now we have Dr. Joy Gleason Carew. She is a linguist and former U of L professor of Pan African Studies. She has focused on the African diaspora and African language and conflict in the global community. She is a noted author and wrote books on the status of Blacks in the former Soviet Union and co wrote Episodes in My Life, the autobiography of Jan Carew, her late husband, and internationally acclaimed Pan Africanist scholar. Dr. Carew brings a worldview and protest. Dr. Carew. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I decided what I would do is I'd like to shape this in the context of looking at the global community, which is one of the things that I do consistently with my students. One of the things about developing a black studies lens is not just to look at oneself and one's community, but also the interconnection between your community and the larger global reality. So I've been teaching in higher education, so shockingly, for over 50 years, or nearly 50 years. And over that time, I've consistently challenged my students, as I do you in this case, in my audience, to widen your perspective beyond that familiar parochial environment to looking at people and events in a larger global context. In many cases, what this means is that we are going to enter terrain that is sometimes uncomfortable and unfamiliar. 
in my classes, like African languages in the diaspora or language and conflict in the global community, I help my students understand that we live in an interconnected world, that this is not just our struggle, but the struggle we wage, we wage in our locales are often linked to other people's. It's interesting, it never ceased to amaze my students that uh, we are so interdependent. They, they have really imbibed this American exceptionalism that America is the place where things happen and it's very important here, but nobody else has any particular concerns or links to it. And yet, if you think about a scale, for those who profit and grow and prosper, you have an equal number who are losing out, who have lost land, lives, and opportunities. So looking at the protests in the global context has been absolutely fascinating for me. Around the world, if you just look at anything on Google nowadays, you can still find these, you found that there was a great energy that, 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 that spread around the world in terms of response to, solidarity to, and also calling accountable one's own society in response to what was happening here in the United States. You know, after the tragic deaths of George Floyd, Amon Arbery, uh, Tony McDade, and of course Louisville's own Breonna Taylor, uh, you know, a spark lit us in this country and protests spread around the country, but they also spread abroad. And for me, that's an important thing to bring to my students and to bring to this discussion today. Within two weeks after Mr. Floyd's death, Tens of thousands of people spilled out into the streets in places as diverse as London, Germany, New uh, the Netherlands, um, um, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, Nigeria, Brazil. And why were they doing this? It wasn't just in solidarity with the US, which of course was exemplified by using Blacks, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, iconography, uh, having the expression, I can't breathe, uh, the chance, uh, no justice, no peace, which I might mention in many of these countries, English is not the native language, and yet English was used for these signs as a kind of internationalist effort, along with, of course, the indigenous language, be it Dutch, be it German, uh, 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 of the particular locale. And to me, this was really fascinating to watch. And of course, for those here in the U.S., I think it really took heart in having this kind of uh, energy spread across the globe. Um, so what was happening is that people were calling for a reckoning for past sins and inequities. And they were not only speaking to solidarity for the US, but recognizing that England, Germany, the Netherlands, and all of these places through slavery and colonialism had its own history to wrestle with as well. Uh, one of the interesting things, you had the Confederate statues being pulled down here in the United States, and to this day, there's a discussion about that in various locales. In places like England, you had people pulling down statues of very famous rich people who had built their lives on the slave trade. Uh, for instance, recently, uh, Colston in Bristol, England was uh, pulled down, and he's a very fabulously rich man very prominent and offered a lot to the community. And so there were wonderful statues all around, but also he built his wealth on transporting over 84,000 Africans as you know, how his family built his wealth. So it's interesting as well, if you look at these, the, the, what statues have been targeted as, as one of these aspects of the protest, you also look at this question of Christopher Columbus, which I know to, to some where it's really quite horrific. Oh my goodness, Columbus, how is this possible? But if you look at Columbus, why not Columbus? He's this guy who stumbles into the Americas in the sense of landing on some islands in the Bahamas, thinking he's in some land off of India. That's where he was heading, India or China, someplace in Asia. And thanks to Christopher Columbus, we have the word Indians. He died never knowing that he'd actually discovered much more this huge landmass stretching from the, the, the barrens of Canada down to Patagonia, but a landmass with enormous resources that will be exploited by Europe, many of these very countries that you have protests going on now, uh, that will then fuel the Renaissance in Europe and then eventually the Industrial Revolution. So while Europe was growing, the rest of the world was suffering. 
But also, if you think about it, and, and still hanging on Columbus here, how can you discover something that people already knew and where people already lived? If you look at the Caribbean in particular, just where he, he landed, he didn't come to North America. So no, he didn't come and discover the US, etc. But he landed in the Caribbean. There were over 6 million Native Americans or Native peoples in that region at the time he arrived in 1492. Uh, when we look at one particular island, Hispaniola, which is what we call uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti today, uh, within a couple of years, the Spanish are counting 1.1 million adults. These are not the children, not counting the children in 1490, uh, 1496. And then within a generation, just a generation, those numbers are down to 11,000. Mm -hmm. 1.1 million adults down to 11,000. That's incredible. So is the European civilizing mission. So part of the protests and the energies you're seeing in Europe, whether it's directed to Columbus or the, those who were involved in the slave trade, is saying it's time to hold a reckoning. We need to recognize what has built the society. So uh, as, as uh, Attorney Neil mentioned, I, my late husband, Jan Karou, uh, was a professor of Pan-African Studies, he spent his whole life studying Christopher Columbus and his impact on the development of racism in this hemisphere. And he notes in his writing that here Columbus arrives in 1492, he's describing the native peoples as very handsome and tall and standing up straight, which for him are the characteristics of, of good characteristics. And yet within a year, he's sending captured people back to Isabella saying that they should be kept as slaves and traded for livestock. Within four years, he's sending 500 people back. Uh, incidentally, only 300 made it, 200 died in the voyage. But he refers to them as heads, like heads of cattle. They're not people. Uh, and so, you know, it is Columbus's encounter of this new world. It wasn't, it wasn't discovered in the sense of discovered. Yes, it, Europe discovered it, but not discovered in the, in the, in the ultimate sense. So, one of the things that Carew writes is it says that the Columbus voyages, and there were four of them between 1492 and 1502, gave the Europeans the colored codes they needed in order to define a pool of labor that happened to be predominantly brown or black. The concept of white people came into being at the same time as that of black people. Both were part of an ideological construct that the Colombian era made necessary so that Europe, Europeans could feel comfortable in exploiting native peoples in the Americas, Africans, and subsequently Asians in the search of gold and glory. So when the Native American uh, labor didn't pan out for various reasons, they turned to Africans. And by 1502, which is also the year of Columbus's last journey, the first Africans are brought to the Americas. But I think that we need to remember there's more than that in terms of the legacy of Columbus. And that is the idea of the other as, as a being that is less than human, less intelligent, exploitable, or enslavable. And it's this mindset that guides the biased decision making even to this day and justifies the structural obstructions that we're dealing with. That black and brown people in this country are dying from COVID-19 infections at a disproportionate rate is often blamed on them for making poor food or lifestyle choices. Little consideration is given to the problem of food deserts or of asbestos or other chemical agents embedded in the walls of their housing. And in Europe, and again, this is what's fueling some of that energy in, in Europe under Black Lives Matter, the pandemic has fallen most heavily on essential workers who tend to be people of color. These are immigrants that have come to Europe, okay? So the, the heavy workload is in the sense of the workload, but also in terms of morbidity rates. Uh, that's, so a disproportionate num number of them not only have to perform this work, but they risk uh, worse consequences should they get infected. So when you look at the pictures of people protesting in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in Europe today and other parts of the world, you see white European faces as expected, but you also see faces like ours. 
as black uh, as a black community activist, A.C. Manandan, a great writer, a great a great uh, observer of society, wrote, "We are here because you were there." In other words, these are the children of immigrants who come to the metropoles in Netherlands, in Paris, wherever it is, because of the lack of opportunity at home. These are the very countries whose people and land and masses and other resources were exploited for for centuries by the Europeans. And so here we have a, a combined energy that is really fascinating to watch. The question of whether it's a moment or a movement we'll come back to later. The last one I'd like to make is about social media. Uh, my students fantastically support, love, and, and live by social media. And indeed, social media has changed the way we find out what's going on in the world. There's no question. The local doesn't stay local anymore. Uh, and the, the spread of the Black Lives Matter movement is an at case, at case in point. I mean, 2013 with Trayvon Martin uh, and uh, the, 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 the crisis in Ferguson, this is when it first started spreading to Europe, but it has now seven years a year later sort of reinvigorated itself with, along with what's happening now. And the point I want to make is that these protests, as they spread around the globe, also make it very difficult for the U.S. State Department and our diplomats to make the case that American democracy is uh, uh, the virtues of American democracy, indeed, when you look at this. So the historical stories that we've been fed, uh, you know, through generations, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 and all this stuff are being dismantled right now. This activism is challenging the status quo. And I think that this brings new energy and new opportunities to all of us. So that's what I would like to share with you at this point. Well, thank, thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Dr. Carew. We appreciate that. Uh, we've talked about history. We've talked about uh, post-constitutionalism. We, we've, we've talked about the international aspect of racism and the subjugation of a people of color around the globe. Uh, but now, what does that mean for today? And we have with us today someone who can speak directly to that issue, Ms. Shamika Parrish Wright, a dedicated community organizer, educator, and activist on the front line. Let me say, on the front line of today's current wave of protests that are taking place in Louisville, Kentucky, every state in the union, and around the world that was spoken to. She will give us her perspective and view into the thinking of those that dare to challenge the injustices that have been raised here in these questions that have been put forth. And the big question, is this a movement or is this a moment? Where is this going? Is this a movement or is this a moment? Shamika Parrish Wright. All right. Um, thank you. I've been enjoying this. I, after you all spoke, I was like, well, what am I going to add? I, I can definitely add to the fact that it is definitely both. I think it is both a movement and a moment. And it means different. It, it has different meaning depending on who you're talking to. Um, when we talk about protests, when we were, and I'm not young, I have three 20 year old, 20 year old daughters. I'm 43. But I'm going off of what the, what the young people are telling me. Their pro, protest is power. Protest is power for them. They might not have the degrees or the property or the land or anything that we have, but they have their bodies. And what I see is young people all over our globe, all over the world. And thanks for that world perspective, Dr. Carew, um, who, who say, look, I have my body. I'm going to show up. I'm going to put my body on the line. And what I see also is someone that's in my age um, that I always see this work as intergenerational, intercultural, interracial, because we know that when we're dealing with classism and all the things that you all spoke about, they, they use those things against us for so long that many of us didn't know where we fit. And I think that now, um, not just by use of social media, but by use of new thinking. I love that you said th this mantle. Um, even raising kids, even having three kids that are adults and three kids that are, I'm still raising, 
I, I'm talking to them about how even the tooth fairy, even Christmas, everything has been dismantled for these generations. And we have to respect that. Um, there's a saying that says within two to three generations, we're forgotten about. So what do we leave? What do we leave as our legacy? And some of them won't make it to our ages, sadly, because of the environmental issues, because environmental racism, because of all the other aspects of racism that have trickled down. And have we, yes, we've made advancements with affirmative action. We've made advances in, with educating and doing all the things we can, but we're still left. We're still left, our youth are still left in a Petri dish of racism. And, and they're feeling it every day in their way. Um, and so the fight looks different to some of them. The fight looks like, do I get on, on social media and I write about it or I talk about it? Do I tag some of these people who I think are causing problems in the community? Do I address my mayor with a letter and an email? And do I find my mayor at his next press conference to let him know that I'm not okay with what I'm seeing him do in the midst of fighting for justice for Breonna Taylor? I think um, when I think about Brianna Teller, I think about why did it take such an angel for some people to be activated, to be activists and to wake up, but it did take her story. It took her story. When I just today, I talked to somebody from Brooklyn right here in Injustice Square Park. Yesterday, I talked to someone from Chicago who, who was fighting with, for Laquan McDonald, who was gunned down there, but came here because he heard about Brianna's story and said, I just had to come. And now, the, you know, thinking about her being the age of many of our children and our grandchildren and thinking about what, what can we do? We are left with youth who are, who are looking for us for answers, but they're not going to wait for our answers. While we figure out what we need to do, they plan to be in the street as much as they can. So I said, um, I'm with the, I'm a co-chair of the Kentucky Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, where I started out in my 20s as an intern, working with Ann Braden, working with um, Dr. Hudson, working with his wife, working with so many amazing folks, and it, it just come full circle. Well, I had took this co-chair and I said, you know what, I'm ready to move this organization forward. And then we went right into crisis. As soon as that, as soon. Soon after our elections, we went right into COVID and then we went right into this crisis. And so I said, what can we do as one of the oldest civil rights organizations? How can, what, what is our work? What is our job? And our job is to be here and to support them and to give them our best practices, talk to them, try to help them listen. I was looking at a meme on social media that said, um, I think it was representative John Lewis was arrested 45 times and went on to become a congressman. I'm worried that our youth won't have those same options, right? Our youth, I just watched one of our youth charge through a firecracker and was charged with weapons of mass destruction. I watched our youth are caked up with felonies. I watched two, a young couple go in, one white, one black. She got a, a failure to disperse, but he got a rioting, a second um, degree felony. I'm watching the disparities in the charges. My professional life, I'm, I'm operations manager for the Bell Project. So every day we're getting people out anyway. And But now with this response, I want to see our youth come in. As I see the movement as a revolvement door, you come in as an activist. You give what you can at whatever level you can give. And then you go on. So they should be able to come here, fight for their rights, fight for justice for Breonna Taylor, and then go on to become the next John Lewis, go on to to do whatever it is they wanna do next in life. But the way our police, the way our police are responding, not just in Louisville, across the globe, they won't have that opportunity. They'll be dead, they'll be in prison. They won't be able to go on and lead productive lives the way we are because they'll have all of these things staying with them. And I think that that's one thing with the civil rights movement. A lot of folks that I've learned from and grew from, they were able to go on to the next level our youth, you all are being crippled at the knees here. I'm seeing it every day, every day on the ground. I'm seeing how they're treated, how they're thrown down, and how this continues to go on. So as an activist, of course, and a community organizer, my our next move was how can we get them the legal support they need to, to get some of these charges dropped? Some of these youth have already been arrested three times since they've been out here on the streets, putting their bodies on the line. The, and and I and so it's it's really uh, as an activist it's a hard place to be right because I can see myself in my twenties right out here with them 
And now I see myself as a professional, as a caring mother first, a caring black woman, that it's hard for me to watch them day after day and cry and, and see them hurting and see them not understanding that Brianna did everything right. She was home. She was she she worked. She was doing everything she was supposed to do. She's in her home. She's murdered in her home. So then we tell these youth, no, get out these streets. Go home and wait. Go home and wait for justice. They're not going home to wait for justice. They're in these streets and they're demanding for justice every day, every day. And then I and and I haven't in in over 46 days. All I've seen is beautiful souls come from all over our nation, come here to this park, go to all these actions, show up every day with their bodies. So this intercultural, interracial, intergenerational fight, I have affluent doctors and, and lawyers and judges' children. They're down here with us in the streets. I have them, their parents calling me on one end and say, make sure my baby's safe. And on the other end, their baby said, I'm here until we see justice for Breonna Taylor. So I said, some of us who can be here have to be here whenever we can. So it's about showing up. Right? Um, it's not just about writing a good book. It's not just about um, telling people to come learn from you. It's about being on the ground. It's about direct aid. And it's about how different that fight looks. But it's really the same. We say, oh, it was always people feeding in the movement. There were always people providing transportation. There was always people serving different roles. We have people from that works in the mayor's office that can't be down here on the ground professionally, but drop off water to make sure that there's things that people need to drop off, um, to come and do med support. Even though they work at the hospital, they come here to help provide medical care. As some of the children, our children, have been hit not only with pepper bullets and tear gas, also with live rounds. Um, and so there's no regard for their life. They feel like either the world is scared of them or they won't, in, they won't talk to them. And so they're out here to say that they, they're standing for something. They're actually doing what we ask them to do when we're, we're telling them to listen to us, to study from us, they're doing it. So the movement is a revolving door and now our youth have come in. And, um, and this is where to me, intersectionality meets on everything that you all have discussed along with the other isms that we continue to fight and I think that it is important to do what you all are doing and also recognize that there's organic and intellectualism there's activity and it's always been here it's been here for every movement every movement has a base every movement has a fight every movement has its people that come and so as they take initiative and do what they need to do I feel like the least that I can do is to be here and to, and to give and use every resource I have so that they can continue on. Me and the women that I've started organizing this with were the same ones who went to Ferguson when Mike Brown was killed, just to be on the ground. Four times we went up there just to listen and to, and to be told where they needed us and to be thanked. They thanked us. So I don't buy into this outside agitators um, uh, narrative that's being spent. What it is, is that people connect to this issue. That's why, like you said, Dr. Carew, people are in Germany saying Brianna Taylor's name, just like all over the world, people know Jesus' name. Jesus' name because his story stood out so much as a prophet. He wasn't the only prophet. There was many prophets that went unnamed and prophetesses that went unnamed, but this means something. And so it, all, all eyes are on Louisville, Kentucky. All eyes are on what we do. And I get, I, I, what I'm saying to people is that we have one of the longest standing um, activist occupation and organizing efforts. And it's important that we keep this going until we see justice because we have kept a lot of this anger that's been bubble, bubbling up. And this is homegrown anger. I talked to the police chief and he said, you all don't do this. We've been angry about the police abuse and racism and police violence. What it is is that pe the, the youth are tired it, it, and now that folks are out and then all the disparities from COVID, you have people who have nothing but energy, time, and opportunity. And it is our job as educators, as organizers, as activists to do what we can to reach as many people as we can because this has to keep going. It can't just be a moment. It has to be a movement and we can't stop. Well said. Well said. Well said. Um, I have to, that was powerful. Uh, I think that brought everything that's been said so far home. 
Uh, but we're going to transition a little bit here from these presentations. And let's have a discussion about what has been brought to the table here. Uh, we've started with the roots of racism, um, Dr. Wright. We've come through the, uh, the legalistic system that actually militates or should I say keeps in place or holds into place the disparities uh, that have been uh, constructed early on and it maintains them. And then we've looked at the protests, how this is not just a localized activity, this is a worldwide piece um, that everyone is responding to. And then Shamika brought it home. She brought it home to what's happening right here in Louisville, Kentucky. So we asked the question, is this a moment or is this a movement? I think, I think the question is still a valid question to ask. But I wanna shift just a little bit uh, to Dr. Wright. Uh, Dr. Wright, it seems like what I'm hearing you say and what I know through my own studies uh, is, is, is correct, but it does not seem to resonate or to be perpetuated as to what the United States is about. In other words, we're the land of milk and honey, we're the land of opportunity, we're the land of all these kinds of things, and yet we're here talking about how people who were enslaved uh, were actually the leverage that was used to create an economic wealth in this country. But that's not the narrative that you hear. The narrative is, you know, we all citizens and uh, here we are. And if you work hard, you will succeed. What do you say to that? Well, what I would, would say is that if you think about when this country was founded and you bring it all the way down, you can look at almost at any institution or organization and you will see that it had some type of connection to the institution of slavery. Um, about 20 years ago, a number of the Ivy League schools, this is Brown University, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they started looking at their own history and come to find out that th those were the institutions where owners were involved in shipping. They were involved in bringing slaves, as one of my colleagues said uh, regarding a place in England where the Brown family of Providence, Rhode Island, for which Brown University is named, has a direct tie to slavery. You think about the, the institution that I'm now affiliated with, the un uh, the University of Kentucky started in 1865. You, it, common sense would almost tell you then who were the people involved in starting that school? But then you take almost any university anywhere, they're, they're existing on the land of indigenous people. So that form of exploitation. But it's very hard to get the average American to realize the connection of their economic wealth are their economic well-being to slavery. In instances of where the United States has won world wars, more recently with Germany, we made Germany look at certain aspects of its more immediate history and German companies were made to acknowledge that their wealth came from the exploitation of others. Because the United States has not been put in that position, we have often ignored that existence. But slavery and economic growth have grown together and still exist in this country today. And of course, it raises the question of, do we at least look, number one, at an apology for slavery? Uh, but until, um, and then what about the whole issue of reparations? But you can't get to reparations if you won't acknowledge your past and at least at some point apologize. And then a lot of people will try to confuse the issue of reparations by then saying, well, how much should Jerry O'Neill receive as an individual and George Wright receive as an individual instead of looking at it in a larger sense and saying, what do we owe the people whose ancestors were enslaved in this country? Well, Dr. Kuro, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to that piece. I'd like for you to, to come in on that. I mean, 
this mindset, there's no acknowledgement. I mean, how do we move past that? Or how do we get to that? I, I tend to agree with that. Right. This is just, this is joy. Uh, I just wanted to point out differently to here in Europe, those young people and not so young people have held their institutions accountable to the point that there have been uh, acknowledgements of the, the crimes of slavery and exploitation to the point that you have institutions that have set up scholarships and other programs to try and serve as a form of reparation, not, not specific to each person kind of thing, but you have more of that happening in Europe than you do here. In the Netherlands and in England, case after case where institutions have acknowledged these links and then have actually put in place programs to try and and, and mediate it, at least in the case of contemporary generations uh, having some redress. We're not, we're not there in this country. Yeah, I might add, this is George Wright jumping back in. In 1908, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, 2008, the Australian government issued an apology to the Aborigine peoples for what had happened there. Clearly, we also know about reconciliation and looking at its history in South Africa, that they've done that. In the face of these things, the United States has still refused to look at itself. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me go a little bit. Just, I was listening to Shamika, and I was thinking, uh, these individuals who are putting their bodies on, on the line, and I got this sense, in fact, I got a perspective on it. It was different from what I thought I was observing. But what I think I'm hearing you saying is, is that these people need support in their effort. This is not just a matter of them going out and sacrificing. And what do you see as the nature of that support? What is needed here? I, I see them wanting to learn. I used to tell people even before this, um, while I was an uh, intern at the Kentucky Alliance, is that our movement work is not, ex ex it's not always inviting, right? You don't feel like you can walk up in those doors of the NAACP, the Alliance, many of the other groups and just give them ideas and have them act on it, right? You usually have to find some way in, become a volunteer, or you can be a, a person that's gonna give some money for a program and you're, you're more heard. And so a lot of what I've seen since we've been down here is over, almost 2,300 of them have joined our online Facebook page to get more involved. Uh, they, they're asking for more information. They're asking for more training. They're not just asking for the waters and the hot dogs and the, the food we pass out. They wanna know how they can take that energy and redirect it towards a longer movement. They, wanted to, they want their work, they want their energy to be sustained. They know that this is a moment right now we all know what typically happens in these situations. We know that justice is gonna be a long time, a long time away. They are very aware of that. But right now they have to get out those houses. They have to do something. And so it is our job to me, they do need support. They do need resources. They do need people who aren't afraid to come down here, pray with them, teach them, um, invite them to, to come out and join the work that you're doing. So yes, that, that work comes in many forms. Uh, we've had groups come down here and have no less than 40 or 50 people in a training. Now we're under constant surveillance, so we only can do certain kinds of trainings, but there's a lot that we can still share and give them and, and, and a very, an, in a good and open way so that they know that we see you, we care about what you're doing. And that's what I'm talking to the brothers. I'm saying, look, I need you here. They're showing me their war wounds and their, scar, and their scratches and scars. And I'm letting them know that I want you to be out here. We need people like you to run for office. We need people like you to go and become a doctor. We need people like you to be an educator because if we don't, we're going to lose out. And, and I, when I heard you all talking about the history, I was thinking, is it because our country is a little younger than some of these other countries? Is America immature? Are we too immature that we can't learn best practices from other countries and get it together? Are we so much on our high horse that we can't say because what we're what we're risking is an implosion. What we're risking is these youth wanting to set this country on fire. Like what we're risking is is so much that we have to be willing to do something different, to step outside the box, to keep having these dialogues, 
to invite them to the table, to let them be a part of the decisions, because they're not just going to sit down and take the lessons from us. They want those lessons to go to the streets and be in the streets. So how, let, let, let me just do this one point, and I want everybody to just jump in. You feel like you want to jump in, just jump on in. But I, I do want to ask this, how do you do that? You know, they're, they're, on, they're on the ground. You can go to the ground with them. That doesn't necessarily connect you. Uh, yeah. you, you show support. You can hand somebody some money somewhere that uh, finds its way into food or something in somebody's belly or something or to fuel some aspect of this. But how do you establish a legitimate relationship that uh, supports that effort in very serious and significant ways that helps perpetuate it uh, beyond a moment into a movement? Well, how do you make that connection? Who do you connect with? I'll be the first to say that I don't have all the answers, but I'm a, I'll tell you what I see work here. Consistency, anything it takes to build a normal relationship, right? From marriages to, so to having a student, consistency is key. Them seeing you show up, them seeing you asking about, or even giving resources on how they can connect to other things. We've seen people come here and get connected to treatment, get connected to housing, get their jobs back, work on trying to get back in school. We, it is actually a community here. Community is wherever you make it. So I think, you know, intentions matter, right? Just like we tell white people, you need to show up and be intentional and show up. That's, that's for anybody across the board. So showing up, being consistent, um, and, and giving people opportunities to, to add to what you're doing. So I think it's hard. Like it's, everyday changes right the police um often irritate the situation so uh, you know on a saturday when they're trying to kick everybody out of the park might not be a good time to try to organize people but there's other times during the day during um afternoon you can plan you, we have a training schedule where folks can come in and talk and and they want they want to tell their stories too so even if it's just to come and talk to people and say how did you get here you know, to, to understand how they even got connected to this work. Some people just woke up and got out of their bed and said, hey, some people work for the metro government and said, enough is enough. I can't keep watching this and this is what I'm going to do. It just depends, you know, I, but I think if you come with everything that it takes to build a good relationship, faith, um, a good heart, and I'm not saying be a fool, and I'm not saying give all your money and your resources away. That's never the way. I'm saying come here and be consistent bring op op opportunities and also bring ideas and then just connect with the people, just talking to them. I'm here. We have other organizers that are here. There's other groups organizing here. So there's always opportunity to do that. Edgy, I've been there. Yes, yeah. you have. I'm not saying give all your money and your resources away. That's never the way. I'm saying come here and be consistent bring op op opportunities and also bring ideas and then just connect with the people just talking to them i'm here okay. we have other organizers that are here there's other groups organizing here so there's always opportunity to do that okay and we're losing a little bit of your sound you might want to check that uh shamika uh cedric what, what, what's your perspective on this <clears throat> I agree with uh, everything that everybody's been saying, but I think uh, in terms of protest and struggle, uh, we often forget that it's an integrated movement. We, uh, we oftentimes look at one charismatic leader or one person who uh, catches the limelight, but it's really all of us. And I really think that what Shamika was saying about an intergenerational, interracial, intercultural struggle is so important. So at every level, you may not be getting uh, publicity or anything, but, but struggle is all about uh, pushing institutions. I think we need to think more creatively about the city government here. Uh, the fraternal order of police in every city has perpetuated oppression, rationalized yeah. violence against black bodies and stood in the way of uh, effective change. Just look at the way that they uh, jump on anyone who, who criticizes them and tries to insulate uh, this type of behavior. And uh, I, I may have a bias for this. I was done the same way. I know it can happen as a black man in terms of uh, the police. The police, uh, four, three of them uh, jumped me on bikes uh, and uh, wrestled me to the ground. And I have neighbors, I live in Old Louisville, but they were telling them, uh, he's a professor, he's just coming out and they, they said nothing. 
And, and so this was my little stroke. I went all the way up city government. I'm filing the complaint. I went downtown uh, 30 minutes after it happened. I filed a complaint, went nowhere, talked to the black police chief, nowhere. Um, and he was more blue than black. And, th and that just shows that this, there's this structural thing. So we really need to reorganize how we think. We need to think about running for office like mayor. We need to think about running for Commonwealth attorney so that we get prosecutors in there who don't disproportionately uh, sentence and try to destroy people's lives. We really need to think about how this punitive motive in structuralism really targets people of color. And so we have a whole th host of things. We need to start looking at all institutions in Louisville uh, and how we, uh, and who is in power in there. There's no real major uh, power center in Louisville where people of color are calling the shots for themselves, other than progressive organizations, of course. But I mean, in the, in the center of power where things happen, city government, the University of Louisville, University of Kentucky, there are things that we should be doing structurally. And I think people are thinking about this uh, more intent with, with more intention because of, of how brutal the conduct was uh, uh, against George Floyd. Uh, it's just uh, horrible. You see that on TV, but then that makes me angry because it took that for everyone to get on board and, and white people too. Now we recognize that there's discrimination and racism. Now we recognize that there's subjugation and oppression. Now you want to be my friend and an ally. And it took all of this. And people have been saying this for years. I think this is why there's so much anger and protests on the street. These are conversations that have been, have been happening for years. And usually white people neutralize it. Oh, maybe you're being too sensitive. Oh, why do we always have to talk about race? We had an African-American president. But we are in this time of the third reconstruction. And so it's time for us on all levels uh, to continue to fight because I think racism is permanent, quite honestly. It, it adapts, readapts, recalls itself. And, and, and now it's not, you know, the, the brutalization of slavery. It, it is the weaponization and mechanization of the police department and other entities and a president who rationalizes all of this so much so that people think that it's okay. And the devastating thing about Trump's administration and his rhetoric is that he still has 39% uh, support. That says something uh, amazing about America. And he could win again, he really could, because people are funny. They, they, when the light is shining, they like to show and act like I'm down with you. But when you're in the ballot box, who, who voted for him? You have to ask yourself who voted for him. And he's still at 39 and 40%. And we're all happy about Biden. I think we need another political party, quite honestly. A Democrat or Republican is not really. We need an independent empowerment coalition bringing together all of these entities. I know that's hard. It hasn't really been done in American history, uh, but now's the time. That's I think I people like you and me and George and Joy have to reach out to these young people who are putting their bodies on the line and that we need to make that connection. What do you think about that? I think that's fine with me and I'm young. <laughs> uh, I think that this is Joy. I just wanted to take two words that uh, Shamika brought out that we need to think about. Impatience. These young people are impatient. They, have, they, they are fed up with what they're seeing in terms of old structures and things like that. And that's also the problem because it takes time to learn things and skills and to work your way back up in the system so that you can change it. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's not an easy solution. There are no easy solutions here. The patience, the consistency is key. The intergenerational aspects of it are key. Uh, and I think that, you know, she points out several hints to us, but the challenge before us is multi-layered. We have to have an appreciation of these young people and their potential and not just cast them aside as, oh, those are just impatient young people. That's another thing. We have to harness that energy, harness that youth, that, that urge to move ahead, but also not kill it in the process of saying, well, you have to follow all these steps to get to the point where we actually listen to you. So that, that's, that's a concern. That's a, she's raised a very valid concern in that area. I think she 
also raised an issue that is very troubling, and that is how many African American young people are arrested and are charged with certain types of offenses where whites are not, and that it will then hamper them in the future. She mentioned John Lewis having been arrested 46 times uh, early in his career. He still has an opportunity. That wouldn't work today. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, the movie Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. And it centers around his defending six people on death row and what happened to them buried. But here's what I got to thinking about it. Think about not just the people on death row unfairly, but think about somewhere in rural Arkansas or rural anywhere or wherever, a person is faced with some kind of offense they didn't do. And they say, plead guilty, we'll give you five years. You say, I'm not gonna do that. Take your chances and get 50. They can do that. Multiply that since a reconstruction down to the present, every state, every county, what are we talking? A million people who've been unfairly incarcerated, unfairly convicted. We don't, we have no idea of just how unfair the judicial system has been to people like that. And that doesn't even raise to a level, it's the death penalty, as horrible as those are that we focus on that we know more about but what about all these other people? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Alan to come on and ask a couple questions and we'll go back to this discussion. We have some questions that are coming in from uh, Facebook uh, chat and also through the radio station as well. So uh, Alan, ask, uh, ask two questions and then we'll go back to this discussion and we'll come back again. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, we know that racism has a historical uh, presence as well as a present, is here presently. Uh, what are some of y'all's recommendations to correct racism, uh, both from an economic standpoint as well as social uh, standpoint as well? Is that a Facebook question? Yes. Already? Okay, thank you. Let me go first, because I know you all have better an longer answers, right? Not horrible. Oh. We don't have better answers. <laughs> My first thought, thank you, Dr. Wright. You gave me chills because that's what I tell people. I'm out here because these are our, this is our future out here. And you're right. You're exactly right. But I, so what I decided, I feel like Dr. Powell as well, racism is going to continue for a while and so baked in into our systems that it's something that we're going to fight. It's that long arc that Martin and people like Ann talked about. It's going to, we're, we're going to just keep having to fight that thing. But in the meantime, I feel like poverty is something that we can do and attack right now in our lifetimes, different areas of poverty. That's why everything that I do, even from working on elections to getting better judges elected that come from a criminal defense background instead of a prosecutorial background, from working to um, in, in pretrial incarceration, which, which makes people make those decisions, Dr. Wright. I made that decision. 20 something odd years ago to get out of jail, you would say anything and do anything you need to do just so you can know when you're getting out. Um, and so that this is not people's death sentence, pre-child incarceration is where I choose to give my energy because it's a way to directly impact poverty because every day people are in jail. Right now I'm sitting right across from our jail. People are in there simply because they are poor. So for me, I try to work on issues around poverty as something that I can attack, but being open to any, any opportunities like panels like this and any other discussions and opportunities to learn. I feel like I'm a forever student to learn and to see how I can take those learnings and, and help the next generation. But that's a way I think we can find areas of, of poverty and, and attack it on a financial end that would help us start to dismantle some of these baked in injustices. It's still a long fight. But I still think that within our years, there's some strides we can make. Like we've been here since 2018 um, doing the bail project work. We've paid over set, about seven million in bails. We've gotten over half of that back. Less than 2% of those people have went on to prison. So do you understand like in an incarceration state to stop that train that's headed towards mass incarceration right from the beginning to kind of take the wheels off of it from the beginning is, a, is one part of this project. But then also my brother just got out of jail doing 10 years 
and I'm watching him go through all the hoops and the hurdles of what it takes to be a redeemed man, a redeemed black man with children. So anyway, one of the things that I do is try to make sure every all the work that I do is connected to dismantling poverty at every angle, from housing to pre-child incarceration. That's how I, that's what I work on. Alan, you have another one. Uh, yes. Um... How can we uh, dismantle the historical misinformation about Christopher Columbus as well as the stereotypes of African Americans? Mm. Mm. Sounds like you, George. Well, I, I was so fascinated by the comments that were made earlier about Christopher Columbus as a person who's taught American history since 1977. I always start off by asking my class, I said, okay, I'm gonna ask who discovered Germany and when? Everybody looks at me like I'm crazy. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just say, okay. Who discovered America and when? And as was pointed out, and you asked the question, you cannot discover a place where people already live. It, it, again, people can argue about the numbers and there's probably no way of completely coming up with the correct figure, but it is pretty accurate to say that there were as many peoples living in the Americas as were living in Europe when Columbus came here. And I say to my students, think about it. If a group of indigenous people had left the Americas and arrived in England and said, we have discovered England, what would people say? People would say that's absolutely insane. Sure. That's oh, what <laughs> Is but that I, I, that's, that's brilliant, George. That's absolutely brilliant. I've done but that forever. It's problematic. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry. I apologize. You didn't finish. Go ahead, George. So, have you ever seen the map? Have you ever looked at the way the, the globes and the maps that we see? We are in the center of the world, of the universe. I always say, what must it be like to live in Australia or in South Africa? They are looking up, right? <laughs> right, they, they got to be looking up because mm -hmm. we're at the center of everything. In other words, what you have to do is to realize that the history that we have been taught really does not include the story of most Americans. When I was in graduate school, they said, we have been told the story of rich white men. The story of rich white men is important. But what about the story of all white people? What about all of the other peoples as well. So that's how you have to do it. To understand, we've been told a very small aspect of the, it is true about many of those things, but it's excluding most of the American people, including most white people. I, 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 got, I, I, got, I got to say this, Shamika is on the go again, on the <laughs> front line. I, I love this. So, Joy, you have a comment on that? I, okay, I got a partner right here. I got a partner right here. We're going to another meeting, but I, I'm with you all. Okay, we all, it's all good. I have to Go say, ahead, the comments that you made about Columbus were just wonderful to hear. I mean, uh, I've been, I've actually been to Lisbon, Portugal, and I've seen a statue of Columbus as he's pointing that way and things like that. But I think the way you articulated was very excellent. Let's hear from Joy for a minute. Go ahead, Joy. Well, I, I, I can't say anything better than what George did. Uh, there, I think the, the challenge is, is breaking these myths that have, we have, they are so sacrosanct about these myths of white men basically discovering, improving, developing the, the, the world that we live in today. And all of the black and brown and other peoples of color who contributed, not always willingly, their labor to build it is buried. Uh, so it's up to us, again, uh, you know, as parents to tell our children these stories as alternate because our school systems are still very much pushing those other traditional narratives. Uh, so it's not a matter of, of unpacking it or dismantling it in a simple, simple act, but it is a process, a process of rethinking and putting ourselves back into uh, the development of the human kinds that, that we are today. So let me let me bring it back home just for a second. We have city government, we have state government, we have federal government. It's not going anywhere. All these resistance, all these structural pieces, they're not just going to roll over. 
all of the things that we're talking about here have gone on for what? Centuries. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to just disappear. So if we're talking about, and what my study tells me is that change, precipitous change, has always happened in the wake of protests. That protests, but it's also taught me that protests, although it brings change, brings change, it does not necessarily bring a sustained outcome. It get it goes into the realm of policy. Who's making policy? Because policy is going to outline outlive us, outlive emotion, and everything else. Why do I raise this? See where I operate. I see this as an opportunity. I think protests offers an opportunity. And I think that as, as critical as some people can be and justified criticism of a city government that's uh, been slow, has not been reactive and not understand his, understood history, have not understood the urgency of change that needs to take place just for justice sake, a state government the same, a federal government the same. I think that people like you and me and these young people uh, cannot relent mm -hmm. that the line has to be drawn now and here. I don't think that we can rationalize this um, in any way. So when those young people put their bodies on the line out there, if we don't take hard and just positions, insistent and persistent positions, then what have we done? Chew on that. What, what, I, would say, what I would say, Cinder Neal, is that we benefit from the actions of the young people or of anyone, if you use the term impatient, if you wanna put that label on someone, that's very important, but it also is evolutionary change. That's part of it, whether we like it or not. In 1929, the NAACP held a retreat in Asheville, North Carolina, and they laid out the blueprint that becomes the college desegregation cases and the Brown decision. The college desegregation cases took until at least 1950 to prove the point. Brown takes until 1954, really May 1955. So it takes both. It's accelerated by Martin Luther King them, but there was also other work going on at the same time. Let, let, that, that's what I want. That's the point I want to make. They got out there and they protested, and and a mayor, who's been in office for a number of years, did what? Ban on no knocks. Insisted mm -hmm. that you wear those cameras. Mm -hmm. See, that's something directly related to a reaction to protest. Mm -hmm. What happens in what happens in Frankfurt? They just had a press conference in which I was a part of, and the president of the Senate's getting up saying. We're gonna, I'm working on banning no knocks. Well, guess what? We should ban no knocks. We should require body cameras. Those are things that are incremental, but they don't really get to the point because that's low hanging fruit. That's low hanging fruit. We have to get to what? It takes a long time, as you point out, Professor. It takes a long time to make change. For instance, if you wanna change police departments across Kentucky, you're gonna have to have some sustained mechanism in place to make that happen. So state government has a responsibility, just like they're trying to do in various locales like in Louisville, and they're addressing these issues in Lexington now. The reason I'm raising this is because uh, I think, although I think your observation is correct, I think all of that, even the evolutionary piece, was a result of urgent action, of taking advantage of opportunities, of people being very intentional, in making change. And sometimes it was longer and sometimes it's shorter. Look at the FOP, uh, Cedric, we're gonna go first name now. Cedric, you, you, you're talking about the FOP. Look at the FOP. The FOP has layers of protections. It's almost profane. If you look at it, in state government, in state statute, that is something that must change. Police, police, have to understand we don't work for them they work for us and they must reflect what the community expects if you don't get that mindset what do we have and i think you said it very clearly cedric 
So what do you think? I'm saying well, that there has to be a sense of urgency. There has to be. And there has to be insistency. We have to be insistent. Right. We have to be persistent. And we have okay. to draw the line. Exactly right. You have That's to have a line. And we can't and we can't take our eye off the ball of things that are, are happening that may not be in the limelight. For example, voting rights. Uh, mm. We have to keep an eye on that. In the last six years, the US Supreme Court has effectively dismantled the Voting Rights Act. Everyone knows about the Shelby County case where the Voting Rights Act was sort of dismantled by the US Supreme Court. But there have been other cases most recently in the last Supreme Court term where the court said that political gerrymandering cases are non-justiciable. In other words, we're not gonna look at systems of, of, of political entities and whether or not they impact and exclude people of color. Those are political issues that the court won't even review. So I think there's an actively engaged attempt by this administration putting out false things like uh, voter fraud, in order to lead to voter suppression. And we see that happening already in the long lines in Georgia, Wisconsin. So there, there's a counter revolution going on against our democracy as well. Not oftentimes uh, as, as uh, widely viewed in the public, uh, but just as devastating, I think. So voting rights is one. There's also something going on with housing. The uh, uh, Federal Housing Administration is totally restructuring the statutory protections for people who want to challenge housing discrimination. Uh, they sent out for advice and comment last summer, and it still may be going underground, where they want to uh, require discriminatory intent when you bring a housing action. You used to look at disproportionate impact, and we all know what that means in terms of uh, people of color, but now they're adding an extra layer of proof to make it almost impossible to prove housing discrimination. So that's just another example of the way uh, that the court in tandem with racist uh, administration restructure what discrimination is uh, and then makes it almost impossible to prove it. So there are a number of little other things that are examples of the structural inequality that this pandemic brought about just under the surface that we have to keep our eye on as well. Well, we have we have about two minutes left. This went so fast that I wish we had four hours to get into this. So here's here's what I'm gonna do. In in 15 seconds each, if you can, what is the main thing you want our audience to live with, panelists? 15 seconds, do it. Go ahead. All right, I'll go. go I'll tell you something. Dr. Hudson told me, Dr. J. Blaine Hudson, who was the Dean of Arts and Sciences at U of L, he said, Shamika, you make people uncomfortable. And that's a good thing. You don't want people to be too complacent because change comes when people get uncomfortable. And so that's what I strive to do every day of my life. And he went from protesting at U of L to becoming one of its deans. So that's a life worth living. Professor Ray. I think we should realize that even though I'm an individual, I'm not powerless, I can make a difference, that I think my standing up, your standing up for what is right can in fact move mountains. It just takes perseverance. Joy the Carew. Well, I, I, I second all of that, but I think also we need to appreciate the fact that our struggle is linked with others and other communities and having that communal understanding can also give us strength as we push forward. If we see ourselves as little atoms here, there, and elsewhere, we're not gonna get much done. The last point I wanna make about racism is if we say racism, it's a huge thing. And Shamika's thing of pointing out, okay, let me deal with poverty or let me deal with uh, incarceration, chipping away at these massive, massive institutional uh, inequities will help us attain, uh, attain the goals we seek. Professor Powell. I think keep pushing back against oppression wherever you find it. Push back against the neutral rhetoric that seems to rationalize and make oppression of people normal. Be engaged with people on the ground and bring the ground into these institutions and don't be afraid to speak. Uh, now's the time. This is the third reconstruction. 
And now's the time. Think about it. We've done this three other times before, it, right up to the Civil War, the civil rights uh, uh, struggle. Uh, then Obama becomes president and post-racialism. Uh, but now's the time uh, for struggle uh, in each and every element of our society. And uh, think of the, the rhetoric that is get, being imposed upon us. We have to fight back it's for our own survival. So that's so, what I want to leave readers with. So ladies and gentlemen, you have heard it. We must keep this discussion going. Racism is not going to evaporate. It takes struggle. It takes struggle from all of us to address these issues. We must keep this discussion going. In my view, we must keep protests going. We must support those who are fighting injustice, uh, not just around the globe, but in our own very, uh, very own community. And from AAI, the African American Initiative, I want to wish all of you a safe and happy journey as you move through life in this struggle because racism must be defeated. There is no option. Again, thank you and goodbye. And who is he, Ricky? He's a state senator from Louisville. Is it, what's his name? Gerald Neal. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's been here in this house. Oh, I had him and state senator from Texas here many years.